Welcome to this episode of the Blind Ambition with Jack Kelly. It's your friend, Rick, from Blind. And today I have the pleasure of introducing you to Mark Dixon, the founder and CEO of IWG. Now, Mark Dixon might not need an introduction. He's one of Europe's best known entrepreneurs. You see, Mark founded Regis, now known as IWG, in Brussels in 1989. After seeing local business people regularly conducting meetings around the small tables of local coffee shops in town. He founded the company with the express purpose of providing convenient, comfortable, and accessible workplaces, and now they're the world's number one workspace provider, covering every continent and time zone across the globe. Now, let's get things started, Jack. What made you start up this company? Because it's it's really interesting to see how you went from like building this whole sector and, and starting it pretty much from scratch for a worldwide entity, which is amazing. So how did this all get started? Well, look, it all started because, I mean, this was my 10th business. I'd done a whole series of other businesses, which I built up and sold. You know, I started when I was 16 years old with my first business and I sort of ended up um looking for offices and found it was a very let's call it complicated experience um wasn't very customer friendly and i felt there was a better way there could be a better way that why why was it that um you couldn't buy support for your business as a product you know why was it you had to put it together and, you know, my background before was either in construction or in factory production or in food production, things like this. And generally speaking, in those markets, you're, you know, creating products that people buy. You don't sort of just, you know, create things that people have to put together. So I could see an opening in the market. And that was me looking for an office. So then I, I researched more, came up with the idea, wrote a business plan, got started um, using my own cash. I mean, there was no, um, I didn't raise any money. Um, and I opened the first center in Brussels in September, 1989. And the, the rest is a long history after that. You know, it's not, the, the sort of journey has not been a flat one since. You know, did this, you know, red, you know, taking office space, making it co-working, did anyone do this before you, or you're the first guy who made this happen? First, first one to do it on any scale, in any scale. Before there were people doing bits, things like it. Um, it was, you know, this, you know, basically sharing of office space, basic sharing has been, been around since, Roman times. I mean, you can find um, even in you know Roman Europe, mm -hmm. um, they had the equivalent of what we do today. I mean, didn't have phones or the internet, uh, but it was just sharing a space. It was an efficient way to do things. And in those days, property was a very high cost, very difficult commodity. It wasn't something that was sort of everywhere. So it had to be used very efficiently. And the same today, actually, driven more by cost and by the environment and so on. It, you know, it's become quite a costly commodity again and quite difficult to use. Again, our job was simply to make it as easy as possible to use it wherever you need it, as opposed to it's all in one place. And that, that was the big change. That was... My business plan was to open up originally across the capitals of Europe and, um, you know, that to make it easy to do business in the then, just the beginnings of, of the European Union in 89. Now, did it take off right away or were people initially, you know, concerned like, hmm, this, this, I'm not used to this. What's going on here? Did you have to overcome some of these objections where people weren't sure in co-working space? What is this? 
How does this work? Okay, took off immediately. Really? First customer was Toshiba. Second customer, Bell Atlantic. Third one was KitchenAid. Um, fourth, I, just basically, I can remember those customers today. Um, and some of the customers are still with us. That's amazing. You know, so, you know, basically, it, it sort of hit the mark in terms of what people were looking for. They were looking for property as a service, not as a difficult thing. They just wanted to say, look, I need something that's all finished and ready to use. I, I really don't want to be in the property business. I, I just want to, I want to put five people in Brussels and we look after the rest. That's what companies were looking for. And then since then, just kept growing, right? It's And, and well, you have, what, like, thousands it, of spaces now, right? Well, we're just coming up just over 4,000 now, about 4,200 <sighs> buildings. in, And we're opening up about 1,000 a year in 120 countries. So this is a universal problem. It's not just a problem in Europe or in the United States or anywhere. It's a universal problem. Our job is, in fact, to provide an infrastructure. Uh, it's not about space. It's about space and everything else we do, full technology platform, um, full communications platform, a full support platform with people, help desks, and so on, to support people doing the work that they're doing. For could be small companies, could be the biggest companies in the world. They all want the same thing. They want to have support so that the people using can be much more productive. And it's all for us, when we are looking at things, we're looking at how we can help people's productivity at a lower cost for, the, for whoever's paying. And that has been the recipe. We're just doing more and more of it. As more people get to know it, more people want to use it. Now, how is it net in today's day where you have return to office, you have remote, you have hybrid? How do you see this playing out? Do you, do you feel that hybrid is going to be the de facto way of doing business for the most part moving forward? Absolutely. Well, it is. I mean, that is proven. It's not. So the narrative's just about catching up today with the reality. And so two months ago, you still had people writing about going back to work, back to the office. In the past month, and right up to there was a McKinsey um, uh, research piece that came out a few days back. And this is alongside Harvard, Stanford, and many, many other research institutions and the industry itself. Uh, their research is saying that hybrid, which means flexible working, will be at least a third of overall real estate. Now, that makes it a $2 trillion total addressable market opportunity. Um, and, and, you know, so it's going to be a huge thing. Now, that realization that it's both permanent and growing is starting to come through. Now, we know because we're talking to thousands of companies that are making the transition, but it takes time. It's not something that happens overnight because, remember, every company already has leases. It has commitments. Mm -hmm. It's got to get out of those commitments to go over to something new. But it's happening now at pace every month. Um, and, you know, as we make the network deeper, get more coverage, it makes it even more useful for companies to, to make that change. But no, it is permanent. It's going to be a huge part of how people work in the future. It's going to be further enhanced by companies getting much better at, at managing people who are not all in the same office. It's going to be further enhanced by AI that allows very good productivity analysis um, to support managers, managing people doing jobs to, to maximize the productivity, maximize the investment in the people. So it's it's really moving quickly. Um, it'd be further enhanced by IT. 
very exciting place to be. All right. Can I, can I, can you indulge me with this for a second? Cause you gave me a really you know, like, like one of those light bulb moments. So you have all these companies that are paying a crazy amount, pick, you know, New York city, let's say for example, the, you know, the rents are astronomical. People don't want to come back into the office. They want to be a hybrid so that they're going to probably cut back. So that's going to be great for you guys, right? That's going to be great for IWG because you're going to see as these leases come up, tell me if I'm wrong, like as these leases come up, they're going to start saying, hey, let's let's maybe get an you know, agreement with you know IWG and Mark and let's let's set it up there. And this way you have that whole hybrid. That's what's happening. But yeah, okay. we're, sort of, we're sort of moving, um, getting much more focus on the United States and the US markets for investors mm -hmm. um and you know so we we had an investor day in new york city last week um which was very successful and we started to build up more u.s investors who like this type of investment you know we're a business that's growing very quickly you know 20 30 percent growth every year um and and we're producing cash at the same time Half of our business is in the U.S. and it's our highest growth market. U.S. in contrast is growing at more than fifty percent each year. So overall, it's you know it's from an investment point of view, um, you know it's it's starting to gather momentum, and it's going from a bit like you mentioned earlier, Jack. You were talking about you know going back to the office and. Mm -hmm back to work i mean this is as the narrative moves people start to realize that, that, that there's something else there they can't see it at the moment they think somehow that we're a real estate company we're not and we don't actually have any real estate we're actually the middleman just like like airbnb or like uber between two parts of the market the mm -hmm. user and the provider um we work entirely in in uh, JV with property owners worldwide to provide the products on the other side to consumers that want to consume more and more. But um, yeah, look, overall, I think the investment case is starting to be picked up more and people are realizing the scale that it could be in the future. Yeah, that makes a lot of how, how does it work now? Because like you've probably seen what's going on in San Francisco where you had this almost like doom loop of just crime and, and drugs on the street and everything. And the, you know, the buildings are empty. Is that maybe long-term a good thing for you that if somebody, you know, if it could kind of fix no. it up, you know, clean it up oh. and that could be amazing. Right. In my experience, uh, Jack, these things go through cycles. Mm -hmm. So I've been around long enough to see cities, go to the top of the pile and then fall right to the bottom. Um, I think I, I did, having been in the US last week, um, I think I saw major improvements in New York City with regard to what was on the street. Washington, even more so. Very clean and tidy. And there seemed to be, you know, it seemed to be better organized compared to previous visits um so i think overall you know cities are going to have to compete more I mean, you can't just be a city you know being a city is not enough having the transport coming into the city not enough you're going to have to focus on two things it has to be a great place to work and most and secure with great amenity and secondly, you need affordable housing. If you don't have affordable housing, young people, especially young people with families, have to live too far out of the city to get affordable housing and the commute's too long. So this isn't, the battle here isn't between the cities and the workers. It's be, between the cities, the workers, and the elephant in the room is commuting. That's what people don't want to do. So... In cities around the world where we see very affordable housing near the core of the workplace, 
these cities, no change, very successful. Everything's full. Everyone's happy. If you go to somewhere, you mentioned San Francisco, very expensive and difficult to get into the downtown. It's quite difficult to travel across the bay as well because of traffic problems and so on. So, and also people have to live quite a long way out to get affordable housing. So all cities have to re reinvent or focus more on the customer and the customer that pays the bills is normally the worker, you know, unless it's, you know, Disney, Florida or something, it's the workers that are paying the bills and it's the companies that are paying the bills. And, but you've got to create the right conditions and the companies will then come and thrive. So I think over the next 10 years, you're going to see a reinvention. I think it's already started in New York. Very, very apparent, the difference between my last visit and this one. And that will have to happen all over the United States. Otherwise, as you're saying, the cities will empty out. People just won't want to be there. So it seems like a, uh, there's a move towards the suburbs where I'll give you a personal anecdote, commuting from where I am. I used to live in Manhattan. It was pretty easy to get to work. Then you have a kid, two kids, you move to the suburbs, and then you realize the commute, even though the realtor said, oh, don't worry about the commute. You realize, oh my gosh, it's just horrible. It's horrible. There's always a problem. There's always traffic. So that if you have offices in the suburbs, that's just amazing because then you go five, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes, okay. and then boom. And then, you know, it's so, so easy. You have your life back. We're trying to get them in about a 10 minute radius mm -hmm. of wherever you would live, even in the, you know, the, where it might be 20 minutes. It would be, you know, I went also week before I was all around Minnesota where we're, you know, we're really growing the network in, in the Midwest, for example. And, you know, where it's in the rural or countryside locations, there'd be a slightly longer travel time, but it's still short. And it's about convenience. So, you know, one of the problems everyone in the narrative keeps saying, well, it's either work from home or work from a city. No, it's actually a lot of people don't want to work from home, but they do want to work locally. So someone like you, Jack, you get an office down the road. You go into the city once a week, once a month, whenever you need to. But you're not sort of obliged to go two hours every day or more to use a computer in a building that's inconvenient. You know, you can do that from anywhere. But the fact is, all research shows, whilst it does suit some people to work from home, the vast majority work much better from an office, working with other people either colleagues or people from other companies, you know, to, to get that social interaction and to have the break between home and work. It's quite important, you know, sort of socially, mentally, and from, from a productivity point of view. You know, it's sometimes quite tempting to get that extra half hour in bed and do a meeting in pajama bottoms and <laughs> shirt and tie. It's sort of, you can't do that if you're going 10 minutes down the road. Mark, 100% agree with you. I can tell you from firsthand experience, and maybe you can appreciate this as a customer, because I, during the pandemic, I couldn't take being home because, you know, I, the all, everything was closed down. But I, after a while, and I don't know if you realize this, but here in the US, and I didn't know this because I would be in an office in Manhattan, it's noisier in the suburbs than it is sometimes in the city. You have yeah. building, you have you have the the lawnmowers, you have the those like you know leaf blowers, and it's nonstop all the yeah. time. So I went yeah. to I went to in, uh, uh, not far from me, a place called Short Short Hills, nice location, and I go there, ten, like maybe ten minutes at most. I, I stop, get my coffee, go there. It was quiet. It was yeah. nice. Got out of the house no arguing with my wife and my kids. So no, there's, no. I'm telling you, no. if this helps you, this is like firsthand experience. So I could see and not, and then I decided I'm not going back to Manhattan anymore. This is crazy. Why would I pay like the rents in Manhattan just off the charts? It's way cheaper to have, you know, some, a setup like this where you could drive there 10, 15, 10 minutes, 
Mm. And and your life is easier. So I, I see how I like, yeah, I see how this and is you playing out. Both as well. So the way our system works yeah. is you can get, you know, take take a room, take a desk near where you live, but you can use anywhere in the system. Mm -hmm. So you can go to where near where you live one day, maybe a week. The next week you can be in Atlanta, in New York, in Tokyo, if you want. We've got oh, no, uh, well over 4,000 buildings now, mm -hmm. but as a member, you can use all of them. And that flexibility to say, wherever I am, there's somewhere I can work and be productive is you know one of the advantages. So it can be local, but it can be also at your destination. Yeah, it also sounds it's like great for the mental health and emotional well-being of people because that's such a it's such an important piece for companies now to promote that because I can just tell you here in the in the US, people are miserable. It's crazy. Yeah. Like be pre prepared. If you kind of move here, Mark, we're out of our minds lately. <laughs> it's just nuts. So yeah, it's, it's a universal it's, thing. It's, it's not just the US actually. But... So you're you're seeing it too where you are. It's it's wild. So by having that like less of a commute right knowing you can get there quicker not having to wrestle with all the technology yourself it's like one of those things like oh you know it's it makes you a little happier right it makes you a little bit really better. Day, look, saving two hours a day feels pretty good mm -hmm. what you've got to do is fill it do something else you know take up a take up a class in yoga or something do something you know, to and that is the you know the issue I think. But mental well-being is a big issue. It is you know we one of the most popular things when we ask people, what do you like about being with us? They say we like the parties, we like the education, we like the social group, mm -hmm. as we do. We put on events for people, and you know that's they don't say hey I had a great desk or they say no actually the social part was actually quite I really enjoyed that yes I got my work done as well but the first thing is always the, the social part because just as you say people are miserable because they probably are spending too much time on their phone I know I do mm -hmm. head down not talking to anyone and then you know too much time you know in in downtime you know you've got unlimited tv with Netflix etc and then you you sort of but that social interaction is quite easy to miss out and uh, so i think it's really important that is and certainly our customers do you know we've got over 8 million users and that's what they rate highly 8 million that's amazing mm. i don't know why all right. When you mention parties, you don't have to answer this if you don't want to. When you mention parties, so you're not going to go Adam Newman, right, and go go off the charts and no, go no. crazy parties. They're not parties. They're they're <laughs> sort of they're generally cocktails with the theme. Yeah. But no, no, we don't do parties. Yeah. So, but um, it's you know keeping this, we're very focused on business. So, you know, our customers, you know, the companies paying for this and the individuals using us are, are serious about business. The social part is about meeting people. And, you know, social is also about business. You learn things, you get inspired, you make business contacts and so on. All of this is in the mix there. But no, these are not sort of hedonistic parties. Um, it's more like a, it's an, it's a sort of, end of day drinks on a friday and i know you you have a vineyard so i guess yeah. the drinks will be very nice wine i suppose so the parties will be sophisticated with very lovely wine less so, nice well, i can't get the wine to everywhere in the world but um, um i don't make enough of it for every one of our centers but uh yeah no we it depends what it is around the world but we do sort of sake appreciation whiskey appreciation these sort of things so it's themed and you know give something for people to talk about learn something we also do educational presentations you know that's what people like and hearing from other companies a lot of our companies want to stand up and talk about what they do 
uh, in their own company. That also, all of that content is makes the going to something a, a, a much better experience. And just if I could delve back to this part, because you know, there's a theme for a little bit here for digital nomads where you can kind of go and work wherever you want to. And it sounds right. like, you know, with, with your company, uh, if let's say I want to go to, um, you know, Nashville and check it out. I don't have to worry about work. Just get my laptop, Absolutely. go over, right? Go to Nashville, enjoy the music yeah. scene. They're doing it. People are doing it. We, what we find is we did a series on um, staycations, they're called in Europe. I don't know what they're called in America. But these are what you can see now is folks, go, you know, deciding I want to spend six months of the year in Colorado mm -hmm. and they do it. And they find somewhere to work locally with us and they basically rent something and live the life in Colorado or Florida or, you know, wherever in the world because it's a place to live. I mean, getting away from the winter um, and or, or getting a new culture. I mean, you can quite literally work from anywhere today in the world and you can go into an office, meet other people, get immersed into that culture. So it's, it's um, and quite a lot of people are doing it. We see more and more people uh, in Europe, in the United States that will be going more towards the coast but not, you know, to, to get great places to live mm -hmm. um, as opposed to great places to commute from. It's quite a different thing. It opens up the country. And where do you see it going? I, I, I guess it's just the trend is that you're just going to keep opening up more and more locations, I imagine, right? Yeah, we, we're making, we're still, you know, if you take the United States, mm -hmm got about 1200 locations we've got 600 under construction um but there's still lots of white space we think to do the us with a full network is around 20,000 locations so you know we're still not even 10 percent of the way there yet. so this you know if you think about 20,000 as a number that's there's about 20,000 mcdonald's in the us to just give you an indication of what concentrations look like so this is, as I said at the beginning here, this is about, we call it stepping stones across America. So you should be able to go really in one step, very large steps across America and be able to work from just about anywhere. That's our future roadmap. And we really see work as being something that's very, very portable. By the way, your office is actually in the cloud today already. Mm -hmm. It's not a physical place, um, and but your ability to work from wherever it is convenient is what drives you on. We're doing, by the way, more and more U.S. airports so that you can work right. You know, when you're waiting for your plane, that's brilliant. You know, these are small workplaces again, very insulated from noise, where you can just do a Teams or a Zoom right in these cubicles. Very, very popular. Um, so, you know, that continuum of work, I mean, we all want to get our work done as effectively as possible, quickly as possible, so that we can get on and do things. We, you know, have pastimes, spend more time with our families, um, less time traveling. That's, you know, in the end, one of the benefits from technology, I mean, there are technology changes everything. What are the benefits? You know, one of the benefits is the ability to work from wherever. Uh, on a side note, with what happened with WeWork, you know, to go back to story, is that, you know, you don't, you don't take relish in somebody else's failure, but is that long-term good for you? Because maybe you can get some of those leases or you don't, because to my knowledge, I don't think there's a lot of other large competitors for what you're doing. So you're kind of running the show. Well, it's I mean, this is going to be a huge industry. So mm -hmm. we're still, even though we've been doing it for more than 30 years, or I have, it's still right at the beginning of its evolution. We work, you know, basically um, right idea execution was a bit 
uh, let's let's call it a bit questionable mm -hmm. but they're in the right space but it's you've got in this business the execution has to be perfect and it's a very detailed very operationally intensive business it's not something you can just get up and do yeah. a lot of people make that mistake um but you know so we work has been a problem for us simply because it um, obviously has huge following and it we sort of get tied in with people say are you also in difficulties like we work we're oh. the opposite we work so our business is very profitable growing very quickly um they they are having to restructure and we wish them the best in that um but um you know it's just sometimes you can get the models wrong does it does it get fresh did or did it get frustrating where you see because this happens a lot in the tech space in the vc space right where you get this charismatic person who's completely over the top like a movie character right really just off the charts get all the limelight but they they get the leases at the top and no one could, could you know says anything because oh but they're so charismatic they're so brilliant and then your 30 years experience hitting away and and they suck all the wind out of it and now it shows like all right you're better off having sound advice what you're saying right really looking at the numbers making sure you're paying the right you know you're not overpaying you're, you're managing your expenses you're not having crazy you know parties bloat <laughs> right so it's just you know steady forward and you notice that too right like you like these yeah, these look, there's many i'm not sure if uh, you know aesop's fables which were written by someone called Aesop. And there's one that's the the tortoise and the hare. Now, the hare was full of it. Yeah. He could win the race, didn't practice, went partying, actually, I think, if I remember <laughs> right. The tortoise just kept on going. So we're not a tortoise. We're going pretty quickly ourselves, but we don't want to make mistakes. So we're investing our own money. So we... You know we're a public company, but we feel as if mm -hmm. investing our own money in this. So we haven't had, um, you know, we have right at the beginning. I had venture capital money, private equity money. We paid that back double, treble um, in the early days before we went public. But this is a business about discipline, like all businesses. Um, you know, it's. Um, you have to focus on the detail and and in particular with the business that is as broad as ours is and with as many customers as we have you, you've got to be able to operationally be very strong so um and you know sometimes when you know they, 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 you can see it it happens in many industries where you get tortoise and the hare scenarios where you have one company that's been doing it for a long time, another company looks like mm -hmm. they're going to run right past, but they can end up getting into difficulties by going too quickly and not focusing on the details. I want to be respectful of your time, but can I ask you just one last question? Yes. To go back, you said you had about, when you started, about 10 different businesses. It. How did you do, did they all work out did they fail because the reason i asked mark interviewing lots of people like yourself i find out that a large majority have tried things and failed and it seems that's just baked into it you know where i think a lot of people just view people who are now successful as it was a straight line going up and they don't realize you know you do, you know, you do well, then it, not well, then this works, then it doesn't work. And then you iterate and then it works and it's, and they don't realize it. And I, it really struck me by speaking to so many, you know, senior level executives, how much they fail and be open about it. So how, how were those 10 things, did they work, not work? Did they, did you learn from that? I learned from all of them. Yeah. Actually. yeah. And, but they all worked apart from the first one. Mm-hmm didn't work that well most of my most of my businesses were always before their time a bit like iwg is a bit before it was <laughs> yeah we started it pre-internet and pre-mobile phones um but yeah i mean but 
look, I got my money back. And that for me is a failure. But huge learning curve in all the things. So just to point something out, you know, I'm um, at the end of December here and looking in December, as we always do, we've done all our budgets already, but I'm working through and saying now with our senior team, what have we learned? What are we going to change? So what we're doing is we go back and look at the budget and think about it again and saying, are we, what have we learned? Do we want to really do something different? And so once the numbers are done, you say, right, well, how can we improve things? And that sort of, you know, I think no matter how big the business, if you've got to stop and learn from what you're doing and say, and do that really deep review um, to say, you know, okay, what's now, what's the bit, what are we going to be like in three to five years time? What do we want to change? So that, what I'm saying in a roundabout way, the yeah. learning process never ends. And by the way, even in 23, we make mistakes as a company. What we, you know, but if you, in my view, if you're not making mistakes, then you're really not trying. Mm -hmm. And you just got to make sure you make small mistakes and don't do them too twice, you know, trying to avoid repetition. And, um, but business is a learning process. It is always a mountain range. It is never a plane. This is great. I really appreciate you taking time out of your day. This, this is awesome. And I really appreciate it because it's for the people who, We'll be watching this and I'm going to write about this, you know, for Forbes. It, I, I love these stories because, you know, you had 10 different businesses, you hit on the one, hit, knocked it out of the park, but you're practical, you're, 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 you're mindful of what you're doing and it gives people hope. See, these kind of stories, I think to me, this is what I really like doing because it makes people say, wait a minute, maybe I could do it. You know, it doesn't have to be to the same degree where you are now if i may okay. just one final thing here a lot yeah. of people ask me family friends friends mm -hmm. of theirs they say well i want to get into business and i said look it's very tough it's much harder you want easy an easy life go get a job hard life start a business but if you're going to do it stop talking about it and do it and do it if possible while you're young and 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 sort of go out and and and, and go for it if you but you have to be prepared to both learn and to fail a bit you're probably going to fail before you win unless you're lucky mm -hmm. and but you most important thing is get out there and do it too many people talk about it and don't do it and the world needs more entrepreneurial people out there to you know to make a better world for the future it's not just politicians that do that. It's business people that change things for the better, for people, for the planet. You know, they're the people that really are the engine room and, and there's always a lack of them and we need more. Well, speaking of that, given, given what you do, is, are there any ideas for people who are budding entrepreneurs that you would say, hey, here's some areas that seem very ripe for growing and building something and making something oh, happen. Anything I that strikes you? I, I can't give my ideas away for free. <laughs> I have about 10, <laughs> 10 okay. I can't do anything about, but um, <laughs> no, there's, look, the opportunities always are right in front of you. So if you're a good entrepreneur, you're looking at what's that, you're trying to find out what's not there. You know, this is, you come back to the, the invention of the iPhone. Everyone had phones, but they said what people want is a personal device that does a lot more than just be a phone. And let's design a beautiful one as we do it. So there are gaps all over the place. So many opportunities um, for good entrepreneurial people to find a gap, fill the gap. And that's it. Just look around. Everything you do every day of your lives, you'll find gaps. Mm -hmm. And they're not all technology gaps. There's very practical things um, that, that are out there that people will buy and will invest in. And yeah, I think a lot of the opportunities for me, if I were young, would all be around um, 
sustainability, not so much, you know, this is about how to recycle things, how to avoid waste. And, you know, what tech, what can be done to, you know, change the, you know, the, the amount of consumption, how can, how can that be changed? Packaging, my big thing is packaging. You know, how can the world work with less packaging? Huge opportunity for great entrepreneurs here. Some are already doing it, but there's, you know, it, 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 it's, there's a massive opportunity there using technology to try and make things better in that sense. So look, I could talk about this for another three hours, so I'm not going to do that, Jack. Okay. But it's all around you, opportunity. <laughs> Well, thank you. I really appreciate you taking the time out. It was great speaking to you again, and I'm 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 so happy to see your success. I'm so glad that you're building up here in the U.S. So, thank you very much. I really appreciate right. your time. Great pleasure. Thank you very much okay. indeed. That's it for the Blind Ambition. If you enjoyed the show, please leave us a five star rating and a review, and don't forget to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening.